You're listening to the Audacious Church Podcast. This message was recorded live at our Manchester campus. We know this is a great investment into your life. So tune in, listen up and stay focused. For any more information, visit us online, audaciouschurch.com. Good, Psalm 130, Psalms of a Sense. We're sort of coming to our final few weeks of this and uh, just looking at the journey that the pilgrims would take from their hometowns to Jerusalem three times a year for the festivals or feasts. We have a new word, don't we? Festivals where they would go and they would worship God, they would eat, there would be music and they would celebrate God's goodness. And Psalm 130 speaks right into this, this journey of the pilgrim to God's city of Jerusalem. And it's a reminder for each and every one of us that we are all on a journey as well. In fact, what each of the Psalms of Ascent are, uh, of Ascent are is they're like a, a microscopic version of the entirety of the Bible from Genesis all the way through to the book of Revelation. Because the Bible tells us the journey that we're on, the journey of humanity with God, where God created a perfect world and He put Adam and Eve in that perfect world. And you'll know the story that Adam and Eve sinned, they did wrong. And so they were kicked out of home, the Garden of Eden. And there was a separation between humankind and God. And so the Bible tells us what God's Son, Jesus Christ did in coming to earth 2000 years ago, to die on a cross on Good Friday, to be raised from the dead on Easter Sunday, to establish the opportunity for us to have relationship with God again, so we can know the power of home. Come on, you know what that's like, don't you? After a really long day. When did you last have a really long day? This week, I had one day that seemed to be like 48 hours in one day. I got up early. I got up before the sparrows were up. I had to sneak downstairs to not wake up my puppy. I left the house early, came back in the wee hours of the next morning. And you know what it's like, hey, when you've been busy and you're exhausted and you put the key in the door and you go, (sighs) home. That's why through the life of our church with thousands of people over the years who've made decisions to follow Christ, so many people have said these words, coming to know Jesus, it's like coming home. And yet the Bible says in 1 Peter that we are aliens and strangers on this planet, that this is not our home, that our ultimate destiny is home in heaven with Jesus, home forever in heaven. You know what I think is gonna happen when we die and go to heaven? I think what's gonna happen is this, is just there's gonna be millions and billions of people walking through those gates going, phew, I made it. And secondly, "Ah, I'm home. That's why there are so many things on this planet and in our city that don't seem to make sense. That's why there are so many things that agitate us from time to time. It's a reminder, friends, that we're not yet home. And yet the Psalms of Ascent tell us of these amazing stories of these journeymen and women, these pilgrims going into relationship with God and the journey that they took. Psalm 130, in preparing for this, I was really reminded of something that took place in my life a few years ago. On a few occasions, I have ridden motorbikes in different parts of the world and twice, I've ridden through the country of Mongolia on dirt bikes. And it's an amazing time. It's amazing. At the end of that trip, I feel more like a man than ever before. You know, I live in a world of man bags and moisturising cream and, and hair mousse. Hair like this doesn't just happen, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you. This takes an effort. And, um, and there's some images of the last trip there uh, in Mongolia. That's me bottom right. You can see the mud, that's the Gobi Desert. Now, the reason I put those pictures up there is because this was about four days into our last trip. And on this particular dirt road, I, I say a dirt road, it's basically mud that's compressed with the heat during the summer months in Mongolia. 
And it was like tarmac, but it was dirt. And the night before what had happened is this, a breeze had come across the desert while we were camping and it had blown some some light (coughs) sand across the, the compacted track that we were riding on this day. And this was just after lunch. At lunchtime, we stopped and what we tend to do is climb underneath the vehicles or certainly try to find the shade of the vehicles if we can, because during the day, it's about 48 degrees and we are wearing body armour. We have the heat of the motorbikes underneath us. And so we're exhausted. I remember at this particular day, can you go back to the first picture, thanks? I remember on this particular day, it was so hot. And I remember calling Sophie from lunch and saying to her, I am so exhausted. I don't know how we're gonna do the rest of this day, let alone the rest of the trip. And this was the moment, moments after lunch, where we got back on the dirt bikes. And um, when you're dirt bike riding, you spend more time standing on the pegs than you do sitting because of the impact on your spine. And we had been riding for about 45 minutes after lunch and we were going quite fast, about 90, 95 kilometres an hour, stood up on the bikes, on the pegs, at which point the lead rider, he was coming towards uh, a, a particular space and just to the left of the top picture, you can't see it, there's a big ravine that drops about 50 feet and yet we didn't see it. And yet the lead rider, as he was riding, he saw it and he touched the front brake. The front brake grabbed the front wheel. The front wheel washed out at nearly 100 kilometres an hour. He went down and slid up the road And then the three riders behind him, they equally crashed as well, trying to avoid each other. I remember pulling up next to this four bikes that were crashed, that were on the ground and thinking to myself, gosh, number one, I'm glad I'm not in this. Number two, I hope the boys are okay. The lead rider, we got down and we we had to support his head while we got the emergency services in. We have uh, had insurance for helicopters to come in and and all those sorts of things. One of our riders, his name was Pablo. We called him Pablo because we couldn't speak his Polish name. And he actually rode off the ravine. I remember seeing his white helmet go off the top of the cliff and his white boots follow. And I'm holding the head of our lead rider, having watched Pablo go off the edge of this ravine. And there was this sense of hush and awe because on this particular moment, we were brought face to face with our mortality. We realised we're not gonna live forever in these mortal body, in these bones. I remember holding our lead rider's head and a few minutes later saw Pablo's head come up like the white helmet. He just climbed up the cliff and got back up and said, what's happening lads? We're like, you just drove off a cliff. And, it was crazy, you can see there on, on the left-hand side, the bottom picture, that's the body armour of one of the riders who we had to send off to hospital. I think he ended up in Thailand or something like that in hospital getting surgeries. And then the next picture is this, <coughs> that's sunset that night. And what you can't tell is we're actually up on a hilltop there and we took communion. We had some goat's meat and some horrible cordial type stuff and we took communion as a way of saying, okay, we're alive. We all survived, by the way. We remembered Jesus. Half of the writers weren't Christians. And I got to preach the Gospel of Jesus on the top of this mountaintop here, this hill, because what had happened was this, is that we've been brought face to face with our mortality. We were around the fire that night as the sunset, about a hundred wild camels came up around us and boy, the camel smell. And, and, and we were shaking with adrenaline. There, were, there was a lot of fear. I remember going back to my tent this particular night and going back to the tent, uh, I looked in, had a torch and there in the corner of my tent was a snake. And so we were throwing sticks and cups and different things like that at this snake. Turned out that one of the lads had brought a rubber snake <laughs> and thought this would be the perfect opportunity to play a practical joke. We, uh, we beat him up after that. You know, I think we all will have times in our lives where we're brought face to face with our mortality. That 
when we're young, when we're at a certain age, we, we have that sense of invincibility, don't we? We can do anything, we can get away with anything. We can, we can, <clears throat> we can even do what's wrong thinking we will still get away with it. And yet here we have in Psalm 130, we have the story of King David. King David had a throne, he was the king, he was rich, he was wealthy. And the Bible says that at the time when kings went off to war, David chose not to go to war. If you don't know the story, he ends up seeing a woman from a distance. He ends up uh, sleeping with her, having sex with her, it discovers that this woman is one of his general's wife, Bathsheba is her name. And so now he plots and he conspires on how he will kill Bathsheba's husband so that he can marry this woman that he's had this extramarital affair with. It was a crisis, a a crazy moment. And here, like many of David's Psalms, he's oscillating between praise and penitence, between celebration and sorrow. And in the midst of Psalm 130, the weight of his sin, the weight of his wrongdoing is upon him. He feels more separate to God than ever before. And then in the midst of this, he writes his Psalm. His private life, has caught him out. He's been brought face to face with his mortality. He sinned. And the pilgrims walking to Jerusalem would sing this song in the depths of the valleys. In the midst of danger, they would sing Psalm 130. Here we go. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, please hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. Therefore, God, you are feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. And in His Word, I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord. More than the watchmen wait for the morning. More than the watchmen wait for the morning. O Israel, O church, O audacious people, Put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love and with Him, come on, is full redemption. Not partial redemption, full redemption. He Himself will redeem you from all of your sins. Psalm 130 reminds us of a few things in this song of ascents, in this journey that we are taking through this life. The first thing it reminds us, church, is this is that deep places invoke deep devotion. He starts off here in verse one, he says, out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord. David here, he is in the depths of despair. It's almost like the worst moment of his life. He has sinned, he's done wrong. He knows full well that he's done wrong. He shouldn't have done it. He's in a hole deeper than any of us have maybe ever been in in our lives. And what I love about David is this, is despite the depths of the hole, he knows where to go. He says, God, I'm deep, I'm in the depths, but what I'm doing is this, is I'm crying out to You. Deep places devoke, uh, invoke deep devotion. And I guess, church, that you are like me and you can probably say back to me that in the worst times of your life, you had your best red letter moments. What are red letter moments? Well, in many Bibles, the words of Jesus are in red. I think for many of us in this room, you would say, Glenn, I know this. I know that there was a time in my life where I was in a deep place, but it it actually invoked within me a deeper devotion to God because in the midst of my hellhole, in the midst of my crisis, in the, men, in the midst of the situation that I created myself, I discovered God was there. That's why David said, even if I make my bed in hell, you are there because something happens. Deep places invoke deep devotion. You know, probably the worst ministry year for Sophie and I was the year 2000. The highlight of that year was our daughter being born. That was a highlight. But the rest of the year was a horrible year. 
It was a year where I was personally fighting with my senior pastor. And the reason for that was because he was taking me out of what I felt was my calling into youth ministry. And he was saying, I'm gonna make you an associate pastor. I want you to deal with adults. I said, I don't like adults. I wanna stay with the teenagers. He says, well, I'm not asking you, I'm telling you. And I said to him, well, I'm telling you, I ain't doing it. And uh, you know, now it seems funny and now it seems pretty lighthearted. But this for Sophie and I was the death of a dream. You gotta remember, we'd left our family and our friends in Australia. We'd left my mum who was recently widowed, widowed, widowed. We'd left Sophie's family, everything we knew to come to a part of Yorkshire that we didn't really know at all. We gave up our life to serve God and serve God with the dreams that we felt He had given us. And yet now, we're sitting in a situation where the man at the front with the big mouth and the microphone, he's making decisions that seem to be usurping and undermining everything that we knew God wanted to do. And so I fought, I fought. Sophie was great actually. I think two or three times that year, I literally wanted to leave. Six times I resigned. And six times He fired me. And I was in a deep, deep hole. I'm like, we are going back to Australia. We're gonna take our new baby. I'm going back to my mama's house because life sucks. Life just ain't fair. I was on the other side of the world with my new bride who I'd brought to the other side of the world and life was just horrible. But I wanna say this, guys. If you wanna have a bad attitude, don't read the Bible. Because if you're finding you got a daily diet of reading the Bible, a weekly diet of reading the Bible, you're gonna find God's gonna speak. So you can even be serving who you think is a monster in the workplace and God, you'll be reminded, is still on the throne. And I have got a bad attitude. It is October 2000, George is three months old. I'm in a stinking mood and I read John chapter 12 from the pit of despair. Very truly, Jesus says, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. And it was almost like I felt God saying, hello, McFly. Don't you see what I've been trying to do for these 10 months? I'm trying to kill you. I'm trying to kill your your pursuit of your dream. I'm I'm trying to kill your agenda. I'm trying to kill in you what you thought was always just about you and your ministry position and your purpose in life. No, I I, I wanted to kill kill that. And I realised in this moment, God wants to kill me. It goes on, anyone who loves their life will lose it. Oh, dogs. Well, anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Jesus said, whoever serves me must follow me and where I am, my my servant will also be. My Father will honour the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And that was a life changing moment for me in 2000 because I realised from that point, even up to now, 23 years later, that it's never been about me. Father, glorify Your name. And for me, in a, in a, in a deep hole, in a deep place, it invoked within me a deeper devotion to God. I went to my pastor, I said, Pastor, I'm sorry, I'm an idiot. He says, I know you are, but I forgive you. Did you know that very week, 
that I was saying to my pastor, I'm sorry, in another part of the country, the then National Youth Director of our movement of churches was in a meeting saying, you know what? We need to ask Glenn, if Glenn can join our team, let's not ask him for six months, but in six months time, let's ask Glenn to join the team because he should be the next National Youth Director of our movement. Here's what I want you to see. Death over here. Multiplication over here. And friends, I just wanna say, if you feel like right now you are in the death of a dream, the death of a ministry, the death of a relationship, the death of a moment, the death of a season, I want you to know that's okay because in deep places, in deep spaces, if you keep pushing into the book, you will find that it will invoke within you a deeper devotion to God. Come on, let's give Him thanks for a moment. Let's give Him thanks that He hasn't forgotten us. Let's give Him thanks that He hasn't betrayed us. Let's give Him thanks that there is no man, no woman, no boss, no pastor, no president, no prime minister that can undo what God wants to do. Okay, now everybody stand to your feet and let's, let's, let, let's, let's, let's give God some praise like He deserves some praise in this moment because God's on the throne, because God's working miracles. Come on, right now, there's a multiplication. Give Him thanks for that multiplication. Give Him thanks for what He's doing in another room, in another city, in another country right now for you because He's working miracles. Grab a seat across this place. Deep devotion or deep holes, deep places invoke deep devotion. But the second thing the Bible's teaching us here is this, is that our sin is our fault, but God. It's important to get a hold of this. Verse three, if you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, who could stand against you? But with you, there is forgiveness. Therefore, you are feared. Now, church, I want you to get this scale here right now. That while it's true that within salvation, God forgets our sins, He does. Jeremiah 31, 34 says, He will forgive you of your sins and remember them no more. While that's true here within salvation, it's equally true that outside of salvation, our sins condemn us. Romans chapter eight says this, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Wow. That's a moment of mortality, friends. That's a moment where God brings us to a crossroads and says, hey, what are you, what are you gonna do with this new knowledge? What are you gonna do right now with this information that's being given to you? Because within salvation, I'll forgive you and remember them no more. But if there's not salvation, then your sins will condemn you. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Hey, I'm amazed how much God gets to blame for things, aren't you? I don't know if you see it in the news. I don't know if you read it on social media. I don't know if you see how much God gets blamed for everything. Even people who don't acknowledge God still blame Him. It's God's fault for this and it's God's fault for that. And it's almost like we're so good at passing the buck and saying, okay, God, God, the, the things that are going wrong, it's your fault that my life has gone wrong. It's your fault that this has happened in my world. It's your fault, God. You know, there's a famous story about Rembrandt. He painted a, an amazing painting of one of the crucifixion kind of scene moments. And of course, Rembrandt, an amazing painter, his friends come up and they come to have a look at it. And as they were looking at the crowd, they look and one of them makes a comment and says to Rembrandt, that guy on there, he, he looks just like you. And Rembrandt had painted his own face in the crowd, the crucifixion of Jesus. And Rembrandt replied, he says, yeah. He said, because it wasn't them who crucified Him. It was me. It was my sin. And you know something, friends, we're living in a world right now where we are so quick 
to pass the buck. We're so quick, aren't we, to deflect the blame and deflect responsibility. Nobody wants to really own up and say, my sin is my fault. And what I love about David here is that David recognised that his sin was his fault. The hole that he found himself in was a hole of his making. My sin is my fault. Gordon Smith, he says this, we can rightly ask, what does it mean to take responsibility for my life in response to the way God made me and called me? The response to this question is that we learn how to work with the hand that we have been dealt. The card playing metaphor really captures the point. We're not being asked to take uh, take responsibility for anything other than the hand that has been dealt to us, including, well, everything. Our gifts, our talents and potential, of course, but also the range of setbacks, disappointments and limitations that have been thrust on it. I like the way that golf handicaps a player so that in the end, I'm not actually playing against others, but I'm playing against myself. All I'm being asked to do is take responsibility for what I have the capacity to bring to this golf stroke, this hole, this round of 18. By implication then, I am not responsible for the lives of others. Yes, of course, we look out for others, we encourage others, we teach and equip others, And we live in a way that allows as many as possible to flourish. But in the end, we are not God to them. And we cannot take final adult responsibility for the other. What's he saying? It's time, church, to take responsibility. It's time to take responsibility. I would say this, that when it comes to every area of life, your life, your responsibility, that there comes a moment where like David, sometimes we just got to own up and say, you know what, I blew it, I made the mistake. I messed this up. And for David, the conviction of sin was so deep on him. You ever had that? Friend, have you ever had that when it comes to Christ on the cross? That, That sense of, it was my sin. It was your sin. It was, it was my sin, that, that, that conviction, that conviction that says, I, I just, I can't live my life like this anymore. I've got to live different. I, I can't have my Sunday church world to look like one thing and then Monday to Saturday look like something else because it's my sin that made Him say, I love you this much. My sin. I would suggest that in our churches across this country, we have a lot of people who love church, love the idea of God, love the idea of having relationship with God. But when it comes to this sense of it's my sin, it's my fault, but God. For the wages of sin are death. Friends, can we not get caught up on this word sin? Sin is just anything that we put in our life as a priority before God Himself. That's all it is. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And David here in Psalm 130, he's, he's, he's kicking himself. He's like, I... I can't believe I did that. I I can't believe I I, I went there. I can't believe I arranged a murder. In 2023, King David would be cancelled. In 2023, King David wouldn't be allowed on the platform. In 2023, we'd unfriend him from Facebook. But God, I got to finish because Rachel's been praying, playing for 20 minutes. Psalm 130, deep places invokes deep devotion. Secondly, our sin is our fault, but God. And the third thing that Psalm 130 teaches us is this, is it teaches us about the nature of waiting. Waiting. 
And I guess we're not all that good at that in 2023, waiting. But the importance of waiting is spelled out in Psalm 130. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. And in His Word, I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchmen wait for the morning, more than the watchmen wait for the morning. Who are the watchmen? Well, the watchmen were those for the pilgrims on the journey to Jerusalem. When everyone went to sleep, the watchmen stayed watch keeping an eye out for those robbers, for those murderers, for those thieves, for those bandits, for those wild animals that would come into the camp and try to destroy the family unit. And so the watchman would watch. I'll never forget when Soph and I moved to England, we uh, took our youth group to our first youth camp, collected youth camp with other youth groups. And um, before all the teenagers were arriving, all the leaders sat together and different jobs were being dished out. And uh, the guy, Michael, who was dishing out the jobs, he said, okay, Sophie, on Tuesday night, you're going to be on watch. And I said, what's on watch mean? And they said, well, basically, Sophie, from 10 o'clock at night to four o'clock in the morning is gonna patrol the grounds to make sure that nothing goes wrong. I said, come again? You want my wife in a little shorts and a little vest top? with a clipboard and a torch to walk around on her own on a campsite with hundreds of teenagers, stopping people getting into the camp and stopping the people in the camp, getting up to stuff that they shouldn't be getting up to in the camp. You want my wife to do that? He goes, yeah, yeah, we get all our girls to do it. I said, well, maybe in Yorkshire you do. I said, I ain't letting my wife do that. He's like, well, it's about equality. I said, yeah, I get that. But she's my wife. She ain't being the watchman. So I was the watchman. It was good. Patrol, patrolled around 10.30, 12.30, came back to an area, shut my eyes, opened them up five hours later. I think it had gone, gone quite well. I don't think anything happened. At least I don't know that anything happened. Watchman, keeping an eye out. And David says here, I'll wait more than the watchman, wait for the morning. You, you know what the word wait is? It means this, it means hopeful expectation. I love that. It's not just a passive waiting. It's a hopeful expectation. It's your mum saying, hey, dinner's ready. And you run down to the dinner table with hopeful expectation that there's something there. It's you as a child waking up Christmas morning. You run down to the Christmas tree with hopeful expectation that Santa has arrived. It's about coming to church with hopeful expectation that as we worship, God gets what He's worthy of. And through the Word, we receive something that speaks into our now moment. It's a hopeful expectation. It's about when you pray, you pray with hopeful expectation. This morning I woke up thinking about my eye and I opened my eye with hopeful expectation that today will be the miracle. It's not a passive waiting. It's not like waiting for a bus. The Bible says in Isaiah, it says in Isaiah chapter 40, those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. That's going to the gym. They will mount up, that's climbing. On wings of eagles, that's flying. They will run, that's running. They will walk, that's walking. But waiting is not doing nothing. Waiting is doing something. It is a hopeful expectation. It's a hopeful expectation for breakthrough. It's a hopeful expectation for miracle. It's a hopeful expectation for healing in the family unit. It's a hopeful expectation that God will restore your marriage. It's a hopeful expectation that your children will come back into relationship with the Lord. It's a hopeful expectation that the prayers you put in the prayer wall this morning, the blue form, will become a pink form next week because God answered your prayers. It's this sense of hopeful expectation. I'm waiting with hopeful expectation. Not fingers crossed, because I don't believe in luck. It's a hopeful expectation that our God who's still on the throne, He's able to intervene. He's able to do a miracle. He's able to bring increase. Come on, it's an increase in expectation. Week in, week out, expectation. So here's where I'm finishing. And this is gonna get really personal, friends. How is your private life? What's happening on the inside? 
What's going on in your mind and in your heart Monday to Saturday? What's going on? Because here for David, David was brought undone by his private life. And church, I want you to know that it's not your public persona that will betray you and let you down. It is the personal, private life that is the challenge. You know, USA Today put out this article in 1997. They say this, scientists now say that a series of slits, not a giant gash, sank the Titanic. The 900 foot cruise ship sank in 1912 on its first voyage, 1500 people died. The most widely held theory was that the ship hit an iceberg, which opened up a huge gash on the side of the liner, but an international team of divers and scientists discovered using sound waves to probe the wreckage buried in the mud two and a half miles down. Their discovery, the damage was surprisingly small. Instead of a huge gash, they found six relatively narrow slits across the six watertight holes. Small damage, invisible to most, can sink not only a great ship, but also a great reputation. And I just wonder just this week, this month, this season, how's the private life, friends? I I really want us to come to this place and space right now where maybe in this room we can deal with some private issues. It's not the hoorah of another Psalm, it's the weight of wrongdoing. It's not the celebration, yada, yada, of Psalm 150. Praise the Lord, O my soul. No, Psalm 130 is this. Friends, deal with the personal space. And maybe what we can do this morning is deal with some big issues. Some of you in this room right now, you know you are involved in relationships that are inappropriate. You know, and I'm not saying it because I know, I'm just saying it because I know that in a room of a thousand people or so, chances are someone is having an affair. And maybe the Holy Spirit has brought us to this point, Psalm 130, post the celebration of Easter Sunday, where the Sunday after, having celebrated the resurrected Christ. Today, some of you need to deal with inappropriate relationships. Maybe in the private life, there's addictions They're just ruining and ruling your life. Big things. But it's not just the big things. It's the little things. Unforgiveness. Offence. Little things like greed that nobody really knows about, but there's a grip, maybe pride. Holy Spirit, I pray that in Your kindness, lead us in this moment, I pray, to repentance. Father, as we think about David and the conviction that He felt over His wrongdoing. I pray even right now in Your presence, through Your kindness, would You bring that kind of conviction to this house? But as Your church, the Bible says, God says, be holy as I am holy. And I believe that what the Spirit of God wants to do this morning is He wants to build and bring a renewed sense of holiness to this room. So would you stand to your feet with me across this place? (laughs) 
out of the depths, I cry to You, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Lord, let Your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If You, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who of us could stand? But with You, there is forgiveness. Therefore, You are feared. I wait with hopeful expectation for the Lord. My soul waits with hopeful expectation. And in His Word, I put my hope. My soul waits with hopeful expectation for the Lord. More than the watchmen wait for the morning, more than the watchmen wait for the morning. O Israel, O audacious church, today, one more time, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with Him is full redemption. He Himself will redeem Israel. He Himself will redeem the church from all of their sins. Church, I want you to see this with the Lord that He's good and He's gracious and He forgives. It cost Him His life. But forgiveness today is easy. It's not cheap, but it's easy. And I'm speaking now to church people. I'm speaking now to Christian people. You, you people who you, you said, He is my Saviour and He's also my Lord. But you know, like David, you've gone down a path of, of behaviour and activity and conversation. And today, you know what repentance is? Repentance is acknowledging, saying, Lord, I'm sorry. Repentance is this. You ready? I'm going that way. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, I want you to know that not only does He forgive, but He can help you to lead a different life. Some of you are gonna start sleeping better this week. Some of you are gonna go to sleep tonight and sleep the deepest sleep you've ever slept before in your life. Some of you, as a result of today's meeting, maybe there's some conversations you need to have with your spouse, with a friend, with a pastor, with a small group leader. So, hey, listen, you just need to know I've, I've been walking down this line. And you need to hear this, there is no condemnation. Let's just peel back that whole mantra of shame on you. No, no, shame off you. It's not a message of shame. This is a message of release, of new beginnings. G.K. Chesterton, I love this. He says this, because children have abounding vitality, therefore they want things repeated and unchanged. They always say, do it again. And the grown up does it again until he is nearly dead. But perhaps God says every morning, do it again to the sun. And every evening, do it again to the moon. It may be an automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately and has simply not got tired of making them. You know what happens every morning? He says, mercies are new. Every morning, do it again. Grace upon grace upon grace, do it again. Love upon forgiveness upon love, do it again. Thank you for listening to this Audacious podcast. For any more information, visit us online, audaciouschurch.com. We'd love for you to join us at one of our campuses, Manchester, Chester, or online every Sunday, 10 a.m. and 12 p.m.